Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Benjamin, and today we are talking about another potential Republican versus uh, Joe Biden. And today, looking at the people who were discussed, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I think of Nikki Haley's candidacy. And honestly, I think she'd... Ha- face a much tougher road in the primary than the general election. But before I get into it, obviously, uh, likes, comments, subscriptions, I greatly appreciate them, and they always do help. Subscriptions, of course, if you're new to the channel, please do so. Helps me out, and uh, why not? Uh, If you like the content, hey, subscribe for more. And, of course, Uh, likes and comments help the algorithm not hate me and if you want to make sure you get new content from the channel there is a bell icon I think something like that I don't know but moving into it we'll talk about the states that I am pretty darn confident that Haley would win outright and not really face too much of a problem We'll go with Ohio, and actually, I think Iowa is pretty similar, but Iowa, we'll talk about Iowa. Uh, Democratic states that I don't think there is a single question about. We'll talk a little bit about Illinois, because I think that it's a little bit more interesting than people will give it credit for. Obviously, we'll talk about the New England state. We're not really going to spend too much time talking about the New England states. Delaware wouldn't be a contest, really. I'm pretty confident about Colorado, and I'm pretty confident about Virginia. Um, So let's go ahead and start with the states that I'm going to consider likely. Uh, Nikki Haley is definitely much more of a suburbs candidate, a more traditional Republican candidate. But there's a lot of trends that are baked in that are going to, as by the end of the decade, actually maybe even make Illinois, maybe not necessarily competitive, but look competitive. Um, but I'm reasonably confident that Illinois would will go Democratic no matter what. So it's not really like I'm putting that there is similar situation in New Mexico um, but we don't know if there's an actual trend or anything so we'll leave it where it is right but the rest of these states there's definitely something to talk about I am pretty confident that she would win Florida Uh, She'd do very well in Miami-Dade. Maybe not Trump levels of good, but you don't have to be as good as Trump in Miami-Dade in order to win Florida as a Republican. Uh, I think it's just too easy for Republicans to win Florida because they have so many routes to victory um, that don't hinge on just one coalition showing up. Um, Alaska... Not really much to talk about. We'll see trends there make it more and more Democratic leaning uh, as things go on, unless the Republicans can turn it around. Texas, I'm still reasonably confident about this, but I'm going to move it down to leans just because I don't know if the Rio Grande Valley is going to be enough for the Republican Party without some rebound in the suburban area and then again Nikki Haley does fit the more suburban mold of traditional Republicans so she'd be able to rebound slightly in some Harris County suburbs uh, in the San Antonio area and maybe Williamson County for example um, and probably around the Dallas Fort Worth area not necessarily win some of these counties but hey It'd be reasonably beneficial. Iowa, I don't think Iowa is the exact same as Ohio in terms of 
its shift towards the Republican Party, I think it's a lot closer to, say, Wisconsin or, or Minnesota, two states that neighbor it. And the reason I say that is there's a non-zero chance that Trump was just the ideal fit for Iowa and that it's just a very swingy state. Then again, the other arguments are pretty darn good too, um, that Iowa is a state that shifted dramatically to the right in its rural areas and it's just taking... uh, say the rest of Minnesota outside of Minneapolis, the rest of Wisconsin and Michigan, as well as a little bit of Pennsylvania, but mostly it's just taking the, the rest of the Rust Belt time to catch up. We'll see in the midterms, um, particularly in the House races, but also the gubernatorial election. Um, in that same vein, I'm pretty confident about Minnesota uh, Minneapolis and its suburbs continue to just grow and take up more and more of a portion of the state's electorate. Um, and that's really the only... I'm reasonably confident about Nevada, even if uh, Nick Haley would carry uh, Washout County, a.k.a. Reno. We do have to recognize that... Uh, it's a state that is very, very, very inelastic. And now we move on to the states that I'm going to categorize as leans. Uh, eh, I'll put Maine in that likely category. I don't think Nikki Haley would do as well in the 2nd Congressional District as Trump would, or in these non-Portland, uh, Maine areas. So, eh, mm, I hesitate to say that she would win Maine. But she'd be a much better fit to the neighbor, which is New Hampshire. And that's because she is a type of Republican who New Hampshire would actually consider. Um, now we go over to the Rust Belt, and I don't think Nikki Haley is as good of a Rust Belt candidate as Donald Trump was. So, I think you have to err on the side of Joe Biden, the incumbent, um, with these states. And as much as I'm a fan of Nikki Haley, I think she wind up losing a little bit of enthusiasm in the Trump parts of the state in exchange for not losing as badly in the suburbs. Um... I think she could definitely win Wisconsin because I don't see the driftless area going back towards the Democrats, especially if the Democratic Party keeps going in the move, in the direction that they're going, where they're kind of pushing long-standing, uh, respected members of their own party out of their coalition effectively because the radical wing of the party refuses to compromise and insists that, say, a Democrat who's elected in statewide office in West Virginia has to behave like, say, an extremely urban district in New York where the vast majority of the people are super progressive. That radical wing of the party is going to wind up costing the Democrats seats like John Tester in Montana, Joe Manchin in West Virginia. It could even leak over into places like Wisconsin with Tammy Baldwin, though Tammy Baldwin's a much better fit for Wisconsin. And I don't see her personal brand taking too much of a hit. Um, but it could definitely hurt Democrats in a lot of these contestable races and that's one we're going to be going down to is Georgia and I'm tilting that towards the Republicans for people who are saying no it needs to be tilt or leans blue or at the very least a toss up state 
that's kind of what a tilt is for me. Is I'm saying it's really a toss-up state. I'm just airing on one side or the other. And with Georgia, the reason why I'm siding with Republicans on this one is mostly to do with it's been a red state. It's been a red state for a very, very long time. I want to see more than one cycle before I say Republicans can't win anymore. It's just like I was hesitant to say that the Rust Belt were red states now. I wanted to see more than one cycle. It's the same thing for the people who are going to say Arizona should be, you know, leans blue or just call it a blue state now. Both its senators are Democrats and Joe Biden won it. And the same thing goes for Georgia. Yes, that is true. Joe Biden won the election in both states. Yes, both states have two Democratic senators. No, that does not mean it's a safe state. That does not mean it leans that direction. To say that is just looking at the situation without any context. Yes, are these states that have been trending towards the Democrats? Yeah, I'm not going to argue that. They have been. But before you make a pronouncement that you're going to you know, favor one side or the other in a, in a particular situation. Let's have more than one, let's have more than one data point, which for both is really just the 2020 cycle. And that's a pretty, pretty poor data point considering how weird the cycle was. Further, in Arizona's case, the only other data point they have is Kirsten Cinema from 2018. Well, that was a midterm battle where the Democrats were favored pretty heavily. So it's really not a surprise that she flipped the state. I had it going for her uh, pretty, pretty early on, actually. Um, so I don't really see that as a data point in the favor of Democrats. I see that as just kind of a, oh, really, the party that didn't hold the White House won a Senate seat in a reasonably competitive state. Okay. Georgia w was a surprise for me, but it's not because I didn't see the trends or I ignored growth or anything. I just didn't think it had gone that far and I didn't think they'd get the turnout that they had in the Atlanta metro. I also thought rural areas would turn out more than they did. As it was, it was, I think, by the raw vote, either the closest or second closest state in the country. And that's in, a, in, a, in, a, in an election where you had three states where the margin of victory was less than 30,000 votes, and these weren't small states. You know, Wisconsin, for example, eight congressional districts. Arizona, nine congressional districts. Those, these aren't what you would call small states. So 30,000 votes one way or another is, to say the least, the, the difference between a margin of error victory and a loss in the other direction by about the same amount. So, yeah, all three of those elections were really close. Um, for that reason, I'm also doing the same for Arizona. I'm actually a little bit more confident about North, North Carolina, just because their state Republican Party, I think, got the right message from 2008, which was, oh, we lost the election in our state. Yeah, let's try to get turnout up, because that was where Obama beat us. It had nothing to do with our policies or our message or our campaigning strategy. We need turnout. How do we boost turnout? And for Republicans in Georgia and Arizona, that 
is the message that you should be taking from 2020. Same thing with Texas, actually. Texas Republicans, Georgia Republicans, Arizona Republicans, don't focus on trying to restrict Democrats voting. They're going to keep doing it because the Democrats that are voting in your states today aren't necessarily the types of people who you would have expected to vote Democratic 20 years ago. Georgia's a little bit different. There's kind of a reverse great migration going on, but I don't think that's the main factor contributing to Georgia uh, being competitive. The real contributing factor is college-educated white liberals. These are the voters that you have to beat because these are the voters who turn out and they turn out in massive numbers because they can afford to. So you need to beat them with your own turnout game or convince them that your plan is better than the Democrats. It's one of the two, and I don't think you're going to, you're going to convince all that many college-educated white liberals to go for a plan that they've been told is evil. And for those of you who haven't been to college, yes, there are professors who really do push their politics on their students. And yes, most of those are trying to paint the idea that Republicans are either stupid, inbred, or evil. And unfortunately, I think it's working. But anyway, the point is that you're going to have to beat these voters. And no amount of voting law alterations or hurdles that you're going to make people go through, regardless of their of the, the validity or the how well thought out these plan, uh, restrictions are, no amount of that is going to be able to stop them from voting because these are not the type of people that a lot of these restrictions would stop. So, just kind of a, hey, let's pay attention to the situation that's actually going on. I'm going to go ahead and end it here. I want to uh, thank everybody who tuned in, and I'll see you all next time. Till then, bye-bye.